So this time I'm going to talk about condition generation. And condition generation is a very wide uh, class of things that we can do in NLP. And we talked about language models before, where language models are basically uh, generating a text from a probability distribution over text. And for example, let's say we train a language model on lots and lots of novels, we can then generate text based on this training distribution where the text it outputs will be a novel. So this particular one was trained on Harry Potter books. So you can get something that looks a little bit like a Harry Potter book. Although in this particular case, uh, if you read it carefully, it's a little bit uh, <laughs> strange, not a very uh, entertaining Harry Potter book to read. So conditioned language models are instead something where we don't try to model the entire distribution of the data that we were given at training time, but rather we also have something else that we want to be conditioning on so that we change the output depending on the input that we're given. So we're given some sort of specification. And this can be this can cover a wide variety of tasks. So it can cover uh, when we have structured data and we output a natural language description of the structured data. So the structured data could be something like a stock market uh, ticker. It could be something like a Wikipedia info box about a person. It could be something like a box score from a basketball game or something like this. The input could be English and the output could be another language like Japanese. It could be a document and the output could be a short description of the document. It could be an utterance in a dialogue and the output could be a response or it could be an image in text. And each of these, oh, or it could be speech in a transcript and each of these corresponds to a particular task in natural language processing. So what would be the first one? I guess the first one's actually maybe the hardest. So any, any ideas? The first one, um, going, that's a different one in here, but uh, the going from structured data to a natural language description is often called something like natural language generation or data to text generation. Um, so I probably shouldn't have the hardest one first. Uh, what about the second one? Yeah, translation, that's pretty easy. This one, there, there we go, summarization. Could be Q&A. This is a little bit more general than Q&A. Yeah, dialogue or dialogue response generation. Image captioning and yeah, speech recognition, ASR. So the point that I want to make by putting this here is all of these are examples of conditional, uh, conditional language models. The exact way you'll want to implement them is different, but once you know the stuff in this class, you could at least make a first pass at building a system in any of these. And I think one really notable thing about NLP over the past you know, six years or something is it used to be that the methods that you used for all of these tasks were very, very strikingly different. Now they are still different, but you can do a pretty good job with the same methodology for any of these individual things. So now I can talk to a speech person and basically know exactly what they're you know, talking about when they're talking about the models they built. In fact, I did this yesterday when we talked about speech uh, translation with other people in a speech lab. And that was definitely not the case 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when all of these were done using kind of very different techniques. So the formulation in modeling basically we talked previously about calculating the probability of a sentence using a language model. So we would have something like this, where this is the next word and this is the context. In a conditional language model, uh, basically now we define X and Y, where we condition the probability of the next word uh, given the context and the output, but also some additional context on the input. And this is used to condition uh, the different 
or generate different things depending on what we're conditioning on. And this can be anywhere from as simple as just specifying the topic of the language that we want to be generating to something as detailed as being a translation task where basically all of the content is specified for us and we just need to translate it into a different language. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, in the application section. So we talked about one type of language model last class, namely a recurrent neural network language model. And this is just a rehash of what I talked about last time. And so basically what it does is it takes in the previous word or the previous context generates a vector from it using a recurrent neural network and predicts the probability of the next word that we're going to see in a sequence. So somewhat amazingly, uh, I remember when this happened and this paper came out in 2014 and I, I was thinking, I can't believe that you can actually handle a task like conditional language modeling in a model that's as simple as this. Um, so basically a surprisingly simple way of creating a conditional language model is instead of having an RNN that reads in just the output, you have an RNN that reads in the input first, because this is an input, you don't make any predictions, but then once you get to the output, you pass along the hidden state into uh, the output and make predictions, start making predictions of the output once you finish reading in the input. And traditionally, this part that reads in the input, the input that we're not going to be generating at all is called the encoder. And the part that generates output is called the decoder. And the reason why it is called this, it has some historical, uh, there's some history behind this. Basically, uh, from the very early days of machine translation, uh, people kind of viewed machine translation as a, uh, let's say, a decoding problem. So it's kind of an interesting way to think about, uh, think about translation, but basically the idea is that somebody had an underlying message they wanted to convey, but they said it in some strange language, like, or some strange code, like Russian. And then uh, you have the strange code like Russian and you want to uh, decode that back into some uh, more civilized language like English. Just, just kidding, of course, you know, <laughs> that's just a joke. Um, but uh, so that's where the names come from. Uh, you can also view the hidden vector here is a code that encodes the original, uh, the original uh, language in a bunch of hidden states and the hidden states of the RNN. Cool. So this is just one example. Uh, you could take an RNN and turn it into a hidden state and pass it into the input. Uh, there's a few details in how you could do this. So uh, what the Sutskever et al. paper did in 2014 is basically they just initialized the uh, output of the decoder from the encoder. Another thing that you can do is uh, take the input, uh, transform it in some way, output it into the decoder. This allows you to have encoders and decoders of different dimensions, because if, you're, if you just do this, then the encoder and decoder would have to have the same dimension, but here you can transform it to be larger or smaller, for example. Another thing that was done in uh, kind of the very first modern work on neural machine translation in 2013, is uh, they took the encoder and they passed the encoder into every time step of the decoder. And the reason why this is a good idea is we talked about vanishing gradients before. So the gradients could vanish uh, if you just pass the input state here and then you might have kind of forgotten the information from the input state by the time you get to the end or you couldn't pass the gradients back uh, in order to learn the encoder very well. So this helps alleviate that problem. And an even better solution that's very similar to this idea is uh, something uh, called attention, which we'll be covering next class. And the basic idea is exactly the same. Uh, we want to be passing in information from the encoder at every time step in the decoder, but it does it in a more sophisticated way, uh, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm.
Oh, that's a really good question. So like, when would you want to transform it from a lower dimension to a higher dimension or vice versa? I, I think probably the answer with respect to that is, well, there's kind of two answers with respect to that. Um, the first answer is transforming it into a higher dimension is, would probably be mostly a matter of convenience. You know, you want to use a larger dimension decoder for whatever reason. But if you have uh, more information here and you're going to need less in the decoder, like for example, for something like summarization, uh, that would make sense to go from a larger dimension to a smaller dimension, for example. The second answer is in reality, actually people don't really do this anymore. They just use attention. So um, you probably don't need to think too deeply about that. Uh, also. Yeah. What are the LSPM and the wouldn't the LSTM take care of the vanishing gradient problem? That's a really good question. The answer is kind of yes, that's the point of the LSTM, uh, but still there are nonlinearities in various parts of the LSTM that uh, are uh, considering the hidden states. Also, um, not the cell, the cell doesn't have those, but the hidden state, uh, in the hidden states it exists. Also most, uh, varieties of LSTMs have things like forget gates. And in addition, even if you only have additive outputs, still it's relatively hard for LSTMs to identify which parts of the input are necessary. And I think that's one of the advantages of attention in that you don't need to pass it through many, many transformations before you get to the part of the input that's necessary and you have a direct connection. Uh, so we'll be talking about that uh, a little bit more later. Yeah. Another advantage, uh, I just wanted to make sure that if this might also be an advantage, could be that some when we are doing language to language translation, some languages say like say my name is Aryan, but the other languages say Aryan is my name. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you remember the encoded value at every step, mm -hmm. it would be better if object and subject and all those things are reversed. Yeah, so um, the question was basically if the uh, if there's different word order between the languages, uh, would it be better to pass it in every time step if the order is different between the languages? So interestingly, uh, when this was first invented, um, they did it between English and French, I believe. And English and French have very, very similar word order. And what they found was they only used a unidirectional encoder. Like after this, most things started using a bidirectional encoder. So you would do it in both directions and then concatenate them together and use it in the decoder. But uh, when they were using the unidirectional encoder, they found that actually using a backward encoder and a forward decoder was better. And the reason why is basically like, if you have a forward encoder and then a forward decoder, every, Every single oh, and, and one thing is if it's hard to see the blackboard on Zoom, um, you can pin my video uh, when I while I'm writing on the blackboard. I actually had a question on Piazza that I forgot to uh, respond to, but um, you can pin my video so it becomes full screen. It might be easier than uh, than that. But anyway, um, so if you have A B. C, D in one language, and then like A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. And you encode this in this direction and then pass it along and do it in this direction. Then the distance between A prime and A is four, B prime and B is four, C prime and C is four. So what they found was actually, if you, or no, the decoder is still the same direction, but if you encode it backwards like this, um, what happens is the distance between A and A prime now becomes one and uh, B and uh, B prime becomes uh, three and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the, this was significantly better in this original paper. And the reason why was basically because these short distance links gave the model something to kind of bootstrap on. So at the very beginning of training, or this is my hypothesis, but I think it's probably right. At the beginning of training, 
this uh, improved the learning of the things at the very beginning of the sentence. And then uh, from there, it was able to kind of, you know, learn the, uh, the other parts of the sentence. So this vanishing gradient problem is a really serious thing. Um, so anytime, anytime you want a model to learn something well, and you're using a neural network model like this, minimizing the number of steps it will have to go through in order to use that information is a good way to kind of encourage the model to learn, uh, to learn well, even if you're using something like LSTMs or residual connections or something like that. So, yeah. um, very, very good question. Um, I got a Zoom question. Uh, can I elaborate a little bit more on transforms? So this transform is usually just a linear transform. It's, it has a parameter matrix and you multiply uh, in. But as I said, this is not uh, super widely used nowadays. So I don't think I need to go into a lot of detail. OK. So um, this is just to give an example of how easily you can create a conditioned language model. Um, and from this, I want to go into how we actually use this to generate outputs. And let's say we've trained a model using one of these uh, model architectures and the standard training methods that we have. Uh, how do we use it to generate a sentence? And basically, there are two methods. Um, one method is sampling. And what sampling tries to do is it tries to generate a random sentence according to the probability distribution. And the next one is argmax, which is trying to generate sentences with the highest score. And here, I intentionally put the name score instead of probability because there's other ways you can calculate uh, the thing that you want to be outputting, but uh, those would still be kind of the argmax, uh, the argmax method. So in order to sample outputs, um, there's something called the ancestral sampling. And what ancestral sampling is basically is you ge randomly generate words or generate uh, tokens in the output one by one. And this is the algorithm. It's so simple, you probably don't even need me to write it up here. But um, basically, while you have not arrived at the end of sentence or end of sequence token, uh, you randomly sample a token from the probability distribution, from the conditional probability distribution. So notably, this is an exact method for sampling from P of X, uh, or sorry, P of Y given X, and no further work is needed. You don't need to come up with any other algorithm. This is the best possible sampling algorithm you could have as long as you are able to decompose your probability distribution this way. Yes. Um, here, here x would be the input. Um, this is a typo. This should be p of uh, p of y given x. Uh, so, so sorry, uh, that's a mistake there. Um, and then, in order to perform uh, argmax uh, decoding, uh, the first thing that you can think of think of is an analogous thing where you do search. Uh, where one by one, you pick the single highest probability word. So it's the exact same algorithm, except instead of randomly sampling according to the probability distribution, um, uh, you pick the argmax. And this is definitely not an exact algorithm to find the highest scoring output. Uh, it will often generate easy words first, and it will prefer multiple common words to one rare word. So let me just give an example of this. So let's say we had a language model that says, um, uh, what, what city is CMU in? And the language model doesn't have a whole lot of world knowledge, uh, but it gives, it wants to give the probability. It has a graph that looks a little bit like this. So the probability of Pittsburgh is 0 0.4. And the probability of uh, nu um, 
or, or let's say what location is, is CMU in. So then the probability of new is 0 0.6. And then we have a 0 0.5 probability of uh, York and Jersey. And then a 1.0 probability here. And basically what would happen in a greedy search algorithm would be that in the first time you need to pick between new and Pittsburgh. So you would pick new because it has a higher score. However, if you calculate the probability of Pittsburgh overall, the probability of Pittsburgh is 0 0.4. The probability of New York is uh, 0 0.6 times 0 0.5, 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. So you can see that Pittsburgh is the optimal uh, like answer here, and uh, but uh, it wouldn't be chosen according to the greedy search algorithm. However, uh, a sampling algorithm would work just fine here. It would still sample Pittsburgh with a probability of 0 0.4, and it would sample New and York and New Jersey with a probability of 0 0.3. Yes. Uh, th this slide here? Oh, it means that this method will. So when you're sampling, you would like, like, let's say we define this probability distribution of Pittsburgh, New York, and New Jersey. Um, if we sampled according to this algorithm, we would expect that we would get Pittsburgh 0.4% uh, of, uh, 0 0.4 or 40% of the time. New York, 30%, uh, New Jersey, 30%. And if we use ancestral sampling, we are guaranteed to get that, uh, basically get the actual full outputs according to that much probability. Uh, so the empirical probabilities that you get from sampling, sampling will match the probabilities according to the model. Yeah. Um, so, this is a problem. Uh, so one method that we can use uh, instead is something called beam search, uh, where instead of picking one high probability word, we maintain several paths. So I have this example here, but maybe the example on the, uh, on the whiteboard is better. Uh, basically, uh, what this would do is instead of expanding, instead of only picking the one best at time step t, you would be picking two or three or four possibilities. And here, if you pick uh, two possibilities, you would get New and Pittsburgh. You would keep them around. You would further expand all of the possibilities from Pittsburgh, all of the possibilities from New, and then uh, use the highest scoring one uh, as your output. So uh, this is a very common way of doing search in these models. And uh, that would, if we had a beam size of two, that would fix our problem without putting New, uh, New York instead of Pittsburgh. Okay. Um, so I, I probably will be talking about this a little bit in a later class, um, but uh, one thing I should mention is which one should you be using? Uh, the, the answer is um, you should probably be using sampling if you want to know what the model thinks is an appropriate output. Um, if you have a well-trained model, uh, where the um, where the model scores correlate with how good an output actually is, you should be using beam search. However, if you're training a model uh, using the standard um, using the standard uh, methods of training, uh, such as maximum likelihood estimation to output the um, to maximize the likelihood of the output in a training corpus. Sometimes your model scores are not very well correlated with um, uh, with the probability of the or with the goodness of the output, and in those cases, uh, you might use beam search and it might find a high scoring output, but the high scoring output might be bad. So to just give an example, in uh, machine translation, uh, for for example. Uh, there's a paper 
that showed that a pretty large percentage, for a pretty large percentage of the outputs, the zero length sentence was the one that had the highest score. And uh, that's a little bit of a problem, right? So there's a lot of hacks that people apply to try to fix this problem. Like instead of outputting the highest scoring sentence, they output the sentence that has uh, the highest log probability The highest log probability of the output normalized by the length of the output. So basically, it's the highest average log probability per, per word in the output. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details of these here, but it's worth knowing that this is a thing uh, that people use to fix uh, these problems. So, um, yeah, so that's the basic idea. Um, I, I see a couple of questions on Zoom. One is, does beam size refer to how many options in each step or how many steps to maintain in the beam? Uh, it's how many options at each step. So if you say a beam size is 50, then you'll be maintaining 50 uh, hypotheses at each step. Um, and someone, oh, someone sent a paper that was uh, was describing the uh, problem I talked about. This actually isn't the paper that I was talking about, but this is uh, a, another paper that talks about the problem of uh, like beam search uh, finding bad hypotheses when the models are not trained well. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to talk more about search algorithms later, uh, for example, in the structured prediction class. So I, I won't go into too much detail, too much more detail. Cool. Um, yes, any, any questions here? Okay, great. So another thing that I want to talk about um, very briefly is uh, model ensembling. And model ensembling is a basic idea of uh, combining multiple models together. Um, I kind of traditionally talk about it here because um, it's a really important thing to know. And this is uh, a good class uh, to talk about it in. But um, ensembling basically combines the predictions of multiple models. And so if you have like your uh, recurrent neural network model one and your recurrent neural network model two, uh, you can bind them together uh, to make a prediction. And the reason why you would want to do something like this is uh, multiple models make somewhat uncorrelated errors. So some models might make a mistake on one word, another model might make a mistake on another word, but models tend to be more correlated when they get the answer correct than when they get the answer wrong. Um, and yeah, that, that's what I just said. And this helps smooth over the idiosyncrasies of any individual model due to uh, you know, peculiarities in the training data or the training order, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, one way is taking the weighted average of M model probabilities. So um, yeah, so this is um, the probability according to model M. And this is the probability of uh, like selecting model M. And the second term is often uh, set to a uniform distribution. So basically you uniformly combine together the probabilities of different models. Um, this is good when you, or no, sorry, I'll get to that in a second. Um, this is a, uh, another way, log linear interpolation. And this is a weighted combination of log probabilities and then normalizing. So. Uh, what we do here is we have a score uh, that we multiply into the model probability, uh, the log probability, and then we renormalize it with the softmax uh, to get the final probability. And uh, this is an interpolation coefficient for uh, model M, and this is the log probability of model M. And uh, we normalize. And this could also be set to the uniform distribution, for example. So um, which one do we want to be using at what point? And we can think of these uh, basically according to logic. So a linear is like a logical or. Um, so the interpolated model will like any choice 
that a model gives a high probability. So for example, if one model gives it a high probability, another model gives it a very low probability, then it will still get a high probability. Um, you can use this in models uh, that capture different traits, or you can even use this with models that give a zero probability to some of the potential outputs. Um, the log linear model is a little bit like a logical and, so the interpolated model only likes choices where all of the models agree. And you can use this when you want to restrict uh, possible answers. So like if you have one model that uh, can give a zero probability when you do something that you really don't like, uh, you can use uh, this as a way to uh, solve that issue. Um, yeah, and actually maybe uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go through this rather quickly. But um, another thing that you can do uh, is uh, parameter averaging. So ensembling, uh, the issue with this is that you need to have uh, eight M models at test time, increasing the time memory complexity. And another thing you can do is you can average together parameters of multiple models uh, to get some of the good effects of ensembling. And what you do is you write out models several times near the end of training and take the average of their parameters. Um, yeah, sorry, this is a bit too much detail for here. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll skip this and come back to it later. Okay, um, so yes. Um, I guess I didn't fully understand the question. So, when you say you have models, is it the same model over time, or many different architectures? Yeah, for, um, it doesn't need to be different architectures. It can be the same model. Um, any any variety, anything that makes the model different is good enough from the random seed to varying the data that you train it on to having a different architecture. So just anything needs to uh, make the models like not be exactly the same. Um, sometimes the more different they are, if they're all similarly good, the more different they are, the better because the errors will be more decorrelated. Um, but it, they don't necessarily need to be different architectures, even just different random seeds is often good enough. Okay, um, so I'm gonna move on to case studies in uh, conditional language modeling. And I mentioned a bunch of things before. I'm going to uh, talk about them in a little bit more detail now. So translation is probably the most common example of this. And it's very, very widely studied. And I, you know, I work on translation. So maybe take this with a grain of salt, but I think the methodology of evaluating translation the level of rigor in constructing data sets and stuff like this is probably better than most other tasks uh, for uh, which conditional generation is used. So I think there's, even if you're interested in other things, there's a lot that you can learn from, for example, the WMT shared tasks here. And the WMT is uh, the conference on machine translation. Uh, don't ask why W exists. It's because it used to be a workshop, but now it's a conference. Um, and even here, they have lots of different tasks. So they have things like news translation, uh, similar language translation. So translation between languages that are very similar, um, biomedical translation. So this is on a kind of unusual domain, low resource translation, where you have very few resources, translation efficiency, where you try to make the most efficient possible translation system, terminology aware translation, where you try to make sure you get certain terminology exactly correct and uh, lifelong learning uh, where you update a translation model. So um, you can look in and each of these are tasks where kind of teams compete against each other uh, to try to get the best results. Uh, so if you're interested in translation, this would be a good first place to look. There's also tasks on evaluating translation systems, but I'm gonna talk about those in the next section. Another uh, task is uh, summarization. So summarization, you take a longer text and output a shorter text. Um, 
one notable thing about summarization is actually you don't, unlike translation, um, you can do a pretty good job of uh, summarization by just copying some of the content in the input. So systems that do this are called extractive systems, where basically they extract some of the input and delete the rest. There's also abstractive models that generate from scratch. And these are more, this is where you would use kind of like a encoder decoder model, like the ones that I talked about. One other notable uh, thing about summarization is that it's done at multiple granularities. So there's things like sentence compression, uh, where you go from a sentence to a shorter sentence. Single document summarization, where you go from a document to a shorter text. And multi-document summarization, where you go to multi from multiple documents to a text. And the interesting thing is the challenges in all of these are different. Sentence compression is, pretty like it's relatively easy um there there aren't as many challenges here and um even a model that uh just looks kind of at the syntax can do a pretty good job of doing this single document summarization is difficult uh, because number one you need to handle longer sequences uh, than for example in translation number two you need to identify which things are important phrase them uh, concisely multi-document summarization is further harder because um, usually the multiple documents will be talking about the same event or something like this, and you need to identify which content is overlapped and get that overlapped content. It's probably going to be important, so you want to get it at least once, but you don't want to say it over and over again. So that makes it difficult. Yeah. Attention. Would work best. attention um, yeah, attention would work best. Uh, there's also other things like uh, copy mechanisms that I'm going to talk in the next lecture, which are very helpful as well. Um, so dialogue response generation. Dialogue response generation is uh, like what you have in a chatbot. Um, given an input utterance, generate a response. Um, this is an interesting example from the Mina chatbot, uh, which you can uh, take a look at. Um, uh, you can see that it requires some pretty uh, interesting uh, things. So like, hi, hi there, how's it going? Pretty well, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, what is your favorite book? This is the chatbot, so that's pretty impressive, I guess. Oh, it's a toughie. Uh, right now, I'd have to say A Dance with Dragons, but Harry Potter is a close second. Um, oh, I love Harry Potter. Me too. I've read the series at least five times over. Um, so it knows that uh, Harry Potter is a series. Haha, -ha, same probably. Which one do you like the most? Probably Chamber of Secrets. Pretty good. So uh, you can see that. Um, uh, you need kind of world, world knowledge, coherence, the ability to handle longer, uh, longer outputs. This is a positive example. There's plenty of negative examples that you can find in the, in the uh, transcripts here, but uh, yeah. Um, one other thing to note is that dialogue response generation in a kind of unfocused chatbot is very different than dialogue in something that's actually meaning to solve a task for you. And um, to solve, when you're solving a task like booking an airport, uh, booking a ticket for a flight or giving people guidance about uh, restaurants or things like this, or all the other things that maybe an assistant that you might have in your house does, then things become much more complicated and you need to interface with databases. You need to do other things like this. So um, dialogue is definitely not just a matter of mapping from one text to another text. There's a lot of other deeper stuff that you need to do to do it well. Image captioning is another example. So uh, the input is image features, output is text, like this. Um, you can use standard image encoders such as CNNs or more recent transformer-based things pre-trained on large databases. Um, Another thing is uh, data to text generation. So when you say uh, natural language generation to an old school natural language processing person, it generally uh, refers to this. And um, this is just one example. This is actually from dialogue as well. It's from a dialogue uh, response generator where you basically um, have an intent that is meant to be verbalized in, in speech. And so it might be, I want to find a, uh, like, I want to inform uh, somebody that the, uh, the hotel has a price range of X. 
and you output that in the structured data format, and then it turns that into speech that you can say over the phone, for example. Um, so this is still a difficult problem. Um, actually, summarization, summarization and uh, dialogue response generation and um, structured data are all difficult problems. So this is an example from data to text generation. Um, where you have a structured data format like a basketball uh, like box score here, and it generates an output that looks pretty good, like the Atlanta Hawks defeated the Miami Heat 103 to 95 at Phillips Arena. Da, 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 da. Um, but if you look at it pretty closely, um, this is an example. Uh, this is an example where uh, the red parts are completely wrong. So it looks pretty natural, but uh, it's not very factual. And that's one of the big challenges in text generation uh, nowadays as well. So uh, one important thing to think about when you're thinking about generation problems is the level of constraint on the output. Uh, and this makes a really big difference in the type of modeling techniques you use in, in evaluation, uh, other things like this. And I kind of put them on a continuum and obviously things are not so simple, but uh, th this is kind of uh, one example. So on the left side, we have things that are more constrained. So things like translation between similar languages is relatively constrained. So uh, for language pairs like French to English or Spanish to English or uh, Japanese to Korean, uh, you can do largely a word by word translation uh, and many of the words have similar roots and things like this, so there's not a whole lot of room for lexical uh, like lexical choices. These are very constrained and you can actually do uh, quite well with them and then you go all the way over to dialogue responses um, or data to text generation and in dialogue responses, I ask you. Um, so what is your. What is your favorite food to eat? And let's say it's an automatic dialogue system. That's a pretty wide set of things that you could be uh, you know, responding to that, right? So because of that, there's not actually a kind of true answer. So that makes it difficult to even evaluate whether it's correct or not. So if I say, uh, what is your favorite, uh, like, what is your, what is your favorite cuisine? Um, oh, I love Mexican food, but nothing too spicy. And then the second thing is, oh, and what, what is your favorite food? And then you say like uh, habanero salsa or something like this, then that's wrong, despite the fact that that would be okay in most contexts. So um, lots of interesting problems with respect to uh, how we evaluate things. And also I think you might hear the words controlled generation pretty frequently. This is uh, something that uh, a lot of people are interested in nowadays. And the basic idea is that we want to add further constraints in addition to the standard content-based ones that we're doing on, uh, that we're doing uh, standardly in these tasks. So just to give some examples, uh, there's things like politeness and style control. Uh, where you take an input X, but also you take a label indicating the style, for example. And this is really important. And it's interesting, there's actually a translation website where they say, a uh, human translation website where they say something like this. So is, it a, is this more of a, uh, a WhatsApp, uh, a WhatsApp person or a hello, how are you person? Uh, where you're trying to, uh, you know, basically adjust the style appropriately. And even human translators need to do this. So of course we'd want our machines to do this. Well, actually, no, German, that's actually pretty certain. The person you're talking to better be your brother or be upset. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For the, for the polite one? No, no, the, the reference. For the, uh, for the reference, no, yeah. Give me the phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't say that anyway. Right. So, um, uh, so yeah, that's one example. Um, other examples are personalization. Um, so like taking input X and aside information about the speaker. And the actual example they have here is on language modeling from TED Talks, where you basically take information about the biography of the person 
and uh, tried to model the way they were speaking. And then there's lots of lots and lots of other examples uh, like this, but it's a common thing. And another way to think about this is anything, you know, any of these things have kind of an inherent constraint on the outputs that you're allowed to generate. And if you add additional control, uh, that you move them farther to the left side, you move them farther to being more constrained. Had a question on Zoom. Um, is intent prediction something that could help coming up with further uh, constraints? So yeah, I guess it depends on whether you uh, you consider the intent being the underlying content that you want to realize. Uh, but uh, yeah, it could definitely come up with further constraints. Another thing, you know, is if you want to create a dialogue system, you might want to have information about the level of formality of the speaker, how many times you've spoken with the speaker, anything else that would result in a difference uh, in how you would speak to them as well. Okay. So I talked already a little bit about evaluation. So I, I'd like to uh, get into this in more detail. Were there any other questions about this part before I do? Have fun at your meeting. <laughs> yeah. um, so now we're going to how do we evaluate? So um, the basic evaluation paradigm that we use is uh, we use a parallel test set. Uh, we use a system to generate, sorry, not translations, but outputs. And we can bear uh, target outputs with the reference with a reference that was created by a human. Um, this is the standard evaluation paradigm for most generation tasks. However, you can also do reference list evaluation. Reference list evaluation is where you don't have this reference and you just try to evaluate how good the output is given the input and the output. Uh, this is also called quality estimation. So it's basically estimating the quality of the output. Um, so uh, that, that's another uh, way of evaluation that you can use. So kind of the gold standard of evaluating is uh, human evaluation. And this is an example, uh, the, the left side is basically perfect. It's a perfect translation. Um, the middle one uh, you can see is a little bit stilted, although the semantic content you can get basically fine. The right one, uh, the semantic content is messed up. So there are concepts such as adequacy, fluency, and pairwise evaluation. Adequacy is basically whether the semantic content can be read uh, well from the output. Fluency is whether the output would be, uh, you know, correct, uh, um, like syntactically or, or with respect to being fluent out, uh, speech in the target language. And then pairwise evaluation is basically saying, which one do you like better? Uh, and this is a, the final goal. Um, you know, we're, in most cases, we're going to want to have a human uh, look at the output. In some cases, you know, if we're using translations so we can translate questions in one language and answer them uh, using a QA system, that's a different story. But in most cases, we want a human to look at the outputs. And however, it's uh, slow and it can be slow and expensive and sometimes inconsistent. So. Uh, you know, if you're using people on Mechanical Turk, they're only going to be as good as they are motivated, right? And if you're paying them uh, five cents for every hour they work, they're not going to be motivated and you're not going to get good outputs. So, um, in fact, human, I've, as systems get better, this becomes a bigger and bigger problem uh, because the outputs can look quite fluent and, you know, somebody who's not looking very carefully can miss major mistakes in the output, for example. Another thing is if you're talking about something like translation, uh, it really is ideal to have somebody who knows the original source and the target instead of having them look at a human translation because the underlying human translation itself could be wrong or uh, less good than the output that you're getting. Um, so, there are um, some tasks that have human evaluation. So the, the WMT shared tasks 
Um, many of them, especially the news translation task, rely almost solely on human evaluation. They don't even um, they don't even consider automatic evaluation to be the gold standard at all. Um, there's also some composite leaderboards. Like recently, there was a leaderboard genie uh, for QA generation, summarization, and MT that was released that relies on human evaluation. So there are uh, systematic uh, tasks that allow you to do this. Um, however, you know, human evaluation is difficult. It's not that difficult. You can do it yourself and, and put it in your paper and uh, or ask your friends to do it. Say you'll buy them dinner uh, if, if they evaluate for you. Um, but uh, there's also lots of automatic uh, metrics. Uh, the most famous ones are probably blue and rouge, which both work in a very similar way. Uh, what they do is they look for overlaps in the individual words or in the engrams of the output. And the more overlap you have between the words, between a system output and a reference translation, the higher score you get. So um, blue is basically looking at engram precision. Rouge is looking at engram F measure or engram recall. Um, and blue is often used for translation in other tasks and rouge is often used for summarization. So the pros are that this is very easy to use, very fast to compute. Um, the cons are that this often doesn't match with human eval and it's bad for comparing very different systems. In fact, uh, machine translation systems now in high resource languages have gotten so good that blue score is now anti-correlated with the best systems. So basically um, people still use it, but really you should be taking this with a grain of salt if you actually want to uh, come, up, come up with a good system. So what should you do instead if you can't do uh, human eval? Uh, recently, there are many metrics uh, that have been created based on neural models that do a lot better. And uh, for example, BERT score, uh, what it does is it calculates embeddings from BERT, uh, which you know I think a lot of people, we haven't covered yet, but I think a lot of people know. It's basically an, a pre-trained embedding model. And uh, you try to find the similarity between the BERT embeddings of the, uh, of the input, uh, sorry, of the reference and the system output. Uh, there's something called BLUERT, which basically trains a neural model to predict human evaluation scores. So you have a human evaluation score, you train a model to predict those scores, and you use those predicted scores as your gold standard. Um, Comet is uh, similar, but it also uses the source sentence. And this is really useful because like, as I mentioned before, um, human evaluators, it's much more accurate when you have the source sentence because the underlying translation itself might be wrong. So um, Comet is quite good. It, it's held up very well in evaluations of uh, these evaluation metrics. Um, there's also PRISM, which is a model based on training a paraphrasing model. So it, it calculates a paraphrase uh, probability between uh, the reference and the system output. And also BART score. Uh, this is one of my papers, but it, it works quite well. It uh, calculates the probability of the source or the reference or the system output given one of the others. So basically this can uh, calculate the probability of the system output given the reference or the reference given the system output uh, to try to match the uh, reference of the system output, but it can also calculate the probability of the system output given the source. So it basically is kind of a, a second opinion about what, uh, how well the source and the system output are matched. Um, so basically, my recommendation now is uh, there's a lot of momentum behind blue and rouge. So if you don't report them at all, people will, you know, uh, people who are used to having these be the metrics you report might be surprised. Um, but if you really want to have something you trust, I would suggest using one of these. If you're doing machine translation, use Comet. If you're doing maybe just about anything else, use BART score. Uh, so um, yeah, that would be my suggestion. When you say training, when it comes to score metrics, mm -hmm. what does that training really mean? Yeah, oh, so that's a very good question. And actually, some of these metrics are unsupervised and some of them are supervised. An unsupervised metric, basically what you do is you take a model 
that is trained on some data other than human evaluation scores and uh, calculate a score from it. So BERT score, PRISM, and BART score are all unsupervised. Um, PRISM is trained to, uh, or sorry, BERT score is just trained as BERT, and then you have a matching function between the BERT embeddings to see how close they are together. PRISM and BART score are kind of trained as paraphrasing models, essentially. Um, there's more detail than that, but they're trained as paraphrasing models. And then the score of paraphrasing is basically the score, the evaluation score. So, so, training, so basically there's a model which I want to evaluate the uh, mm -hmm. score for that model. Mm -hmm. So are you talking about training that model in a specific way and then? Uh, no, no. So this is a model that does evaluation. So just to give an example, um, if you have PRISM, it would calculate the probability that the reference is a paraphrase of the system output or vice versa. And so this is trained before you do any model generation. You have a separate model that generates the actual system output. Um, there's also supervised metrics. Bluert and Comet are supervised metrics. And what you need to do there is you need to um, have a human evaluate a whole bunch of outputs. And then the models themselves will try to predict what a human would predict given this input and output. So basically, they're trying to predict what a human evaluator would say. Question. Very so very good question. How trustworthy are these metrics and how well do they work on out of domain data? Um, so Bluert and uh, to a lesser extent Comet have actually uh, evaluated this. And Bluert has a, a trick in it where basically they take an extremely huge data set and uh, generate a whole bunch of automatic uh, translations or summarizations or something like this and calculate these uh, metrics like blue or rouge and then train the model to predict those metrics first before fine tuning it on human evaluation scores. And the reason why this is good is you already have something that's pretty good at predicting an evaluation score, even if it's not the gold standard. And this proved like really important for generalization out of domain. But if you do something like that, then it actually generalizes quite well out of domain. Yeah. Is it possible to have some downstream tasks which can, on which you can clear the trigger? Is it possible to have a downstream task on which um, you can evaluate? And yes, there's actually a difference between intrinsic evaluation and extrinsic evaluation, which I didn't put here, but maybe I should have. Intrinsic evaluation is basically evaluating how good your outputs are on their own. It's extrinsic evaluation is evaluating how good they are with respect to some downstream task. And um, I think these are basically two different things. Uh, there's not really a guarantee that they will be correlated well. I think they'll be correlated somewhat most of the time, but there's not a guarantee they'll be correlated well. So just to give an example, uh, let's say you wanted to train a model that, um, let's say you wanted to train a model that was good for cross-lingual information retrieval or search. There, it's really, really important to get the keywords right, but it's not super important to get the grammar right. So uh, because of that, uh, you know, you might have a very disfluent translation system as long as it got the words right. And that would be better than a fluent system that got the keywords wrong more often. So um, I think doing both is, is great. Uh, so if there's a downstream application that you care about, then that's a good idea. Um, how do these metrics compare in terms of computational time? Very, very good question. These are much slower than blue, uh, for sure, because you need to run uh, BERT or uh, BART or some other uh, embedding model on the outputs. Fortunately, you only need to apply them to your test set most of the time, and the test sets are pretty small, so it's not super expensive. Um, I had another question. Uh, given a model for generation and a model for evaluation, is it possible to construct a GAN structure where both models improve? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we're going to talk more about GANs for text later. Um, GAN, GANs, I think a lot of people have heard about them, but just to summarize, basically you train 
one model to uh, generate things, another model to try to tell whether that thing is generated or uh, human human generated or machine generated. It's a pretty difficult learning problem, and it's pretty, it's even more difficult in text because of some of the optimization challenges. Um, however, training a model um, that evaluates text better than uh, better than blue or better than maximum likelihood, and then using that to optimize um, a machine translation model or something is a great idea. Uh, because the optimization problem, you don't need to optimize a generator and a discriminator at the same time, but you just need to optimize the model doing the generation. And we actually have a paper uh, that demonstrates that this uh, works pretty well. Um, it's called, it's this paper, if anybody's interested, Beyond Blue, uh, Training Neural Machine Translation and Semantic Similarities. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a good idea and it, it works. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna skip that part for now. Um, so I talked a little bit about uh, which one to use. So one, one thing I was saying is like, this metric is better, this metric is worse, but how do I know that that's actually the case? And the way I know this is a case is uh, because we do something called meta evaluation. And what this does is this runs human evaluation and automatic evaluation on the same outputs and calculates the correlation between them. Uh, so we hope that you know, our uh, evaluation metric uh, will correlate well with human evaluation and it will score things higher that humans would also score higher. And um, some examples for this are the WMT metrics task. This is a really wonderful task. Um, uh, that has been done for many, many years that very extensively evaluates uh, machine translation evaluation metrics. There's also a, a couple data sets, including the real sum data set that we released and others for other things like summarization. There's also some for dialogue response generation, uh, et cetera. Um, so uh, evaluation is very hard, especially for good systems. I said this already. Um, most metrics had no correlation with human evaluation over some of the best systems at the WMT 2019 tasks. Uh, this was a really big result. It was uh, very impressive where you can see that basically almost every metric we had was anti-correlated with human evaluation um, for the very best systems. Uh, fortunately, in 2020, all of those evaluation metrics came out as a result as a result of this result, basically. Like everybody was like, oh, we really need to work on evaluation. So now we have uh, many more options, but it's something you need to be very careful about if you actually uh, care about your system. So um, yeah, so I, I have a couple more uh, questions in uh, Zoom, I can take a few more. Um, can I elaborate on how BART score and other metrics can handle text in different domains and different generation tasks? Um, so I think one thing is that the evaluation in general is trying to take in an input, a reference and a system output. So almost all of the time you're gonna be taking in these three things and the basic thing that you want to do is determine whether the system output has the same semantics or can be has the same same or similar semantics to the the system output and because of this this is essentially a paraphrase detection task um bart score for example is um it's using bart a model that was trained on lots and lots of data from many domains and uh, we're gonna be talking more about pre-training like sequence sequence pre-training like BART later, but because this was trained on raw text from so many different domains, it's relatively domain uh, robust basically. So it can, be, uh, it can be used across domains because of that. And if it's not domain robust, you can always continue training it on text from that domain and that would improve its robustness on that domain. Um, any, any other questions? I see one in the back.
how are how are blue scores anti-correlated with human evaluation? So um, yeah, sorry, how are blue scores anti-correlated with human evaluation? So I'll actually show you the um, I'll show you the graph. So this is the uh, this is the paper, and um, you you will see it is very comprehensive. It gives you lots of information. Um, another thing is normally in a shared task you like build a system to generate outputs, and then you evaluate how good the outputs are. Here you you build a system to generate uh, like. You build a system to, to generate evaluation scores and you compete with respect to how correlated the evaluation scores are with human evaluation. Um, so a lot of uh, people basically submitted systems and uh, you measure the correlation on the segment level or on the, uh, on the um, system level. So how well can metrics determine between well-translated segments and uh, how well can um, you uh, measure the, uh, evaluate well-translated, um, sorry, how, how well uh, a system does against another. So this is uh, an example. So this is blue score on the x-axis and uh, this direct assessment score. It's basically a, a variety of human evaluation. And you can see, if you look at the correlation over all systems, it's not actually that bad. Uh, you, can, you can see a pretty strong positive correlation between these. But as you get up to the best systems and only take the best systems, you can see that for the top four systems, there's actually a, a negative correlation between the uh, blue score and the human evaluation score. And this is blue. Everybody loves to, like including me, everybody loves to complain about how bad blue is. I think the most shocking thing, and, and so what this is showing is basically um, how well correlated blue score is uh, based on how many of the top systems you take. And you can see the correlation gets worse as your systems get better. Um, the most shocking thing from this paper is this here, where basically every, every metric, um, as you uh, as you got to the top systems, just got worse. So every metric was uh, was poorer. And um, however, there were a few that uh, that basically the uh, correlation got better. These are metrics that didn't look at the human translations at all. They didn't look at overlap with the human translations at all, and they just looked at how fluent the output was, and they were better correlated. I see a hand in the back. How with the rouge score? Um, we don't traditionally use rouge in MT. It's more used for summarization. Um, there's not really a super good reason for that, actually. But um, uh, basically, uh, I would be very surprised if it was very different than blue. It's probably similar. Yeah. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah. When you say top model. If they are already comparing metrics, then they are top models based on what? Human evaluation. So these are top models based on human evaluation. Yeah. Okay, so same same question. Yeah, real, really good question. So when the papers came out originally, the correlations were high, and yes, they were uh, they were relatively high. What has changed? Our systems are better, uh, so we have better systems, uh, and because of the this, the so one of the major problems with blue, for example, is blue doesn't determine the importance of individual words in the sentence. So it will give you the same score for getting the word it correct as it will give you 
for getting translation or um, like Carnegie or something like that uh, correct. And getting it correct is a lot less important. You miss it and you'll probably still get the meaning of the sentence. Um, so back then, just all systems were so bad that they struggled to even get the correct words in the output. But now the difference between a really good system and a pretty good system is whether it gets the one main word in the sentence correct. And if you get the one main word in the sentence wrong, then you're completely out of luck. So um, it might overscore systems that basically are slightly better at getting the style uh, blue or rouge might score uh, like systems better if they're slightly better at getting the style correct. So they get like the little function word usages correct, but it won't downweight them a whole bunch if they like make mistakes on content words, for example. So um, go one, two, three. How capacity controlled variable? Okay. Um, so what, what do you, what do you mean by capacity? Like how big the model is? Oh, perplexity. Okay. Um, so perplexity. Oh yeah. Sorry. I, I skipped that slide. Um, yeah, so perplexity, um, we talked about perplexity previously and um, perplexity, yes. So we talked about perplexity previously and perplexity basically is um, the exponentiated negative log probability of the output. So it's lower if your model assigns higher probability to uh, outputs. Uh, that are actually in your uh, development or test set. Um, the reason why this can solve the problem, so the multiple reference problem is that um, the issue with evaluating text generation is you can have multiple outputs that are potentially correct. So that's what I'm calling the multiple reference problem. Uh, the thing about perplexity is that you measure it with respect to the reference, but the model will still give probability to multiple different to many different references or to many different sentences. So if it gives a high probability to all reasonable sentences, you'll get a good perplexity. Um, and you don't need to worry quite as much about like small surface level differences, like the differences in function word usage, because you don't need to commit to a single function word usage. You can give prob high probability to like many different sentences that have slightly different usages as long as you get the, um, as long as you give all of them high probabilities. So basically that's the idea behind why perplexity is not a bad metric. Um, yes. Oh, yes. So uh, regarding the newer evaluation metrics, do any of them try to consider the like important words in the sentence? Um, some of them do explicitly, yes, and some of them do implicitly. Uh, like for example, BERT score has a version that upweights things based on their TF-IDF score. Um, Bluert and Comet, the kind of trainable metrics, will kind of assume that the model will figure that out for you. So they're kind of assuming that by training to uh, maximize the human evaluation score, the models will learn to do that implicitly, for example. Um, I have a few questions in, in Zoom, so I'll, I'll jump to them before uh, getting back to people in the room. So um, uh, these evaluation metrics are only used for final test evaluation, not training loss. Um, uh, the Beyond Blue paper I showed uh, demonstrates how they can use them for training. Um, However, that's unusual. It's more common to use uh, maximum likelihood for training. Um, uh, how were methods identified as the best ones in the first place? That's through meta-evaluation. Um, and word order matters a lot for blue, but does, not, does it matter for these other metrics as well? If you shuffle the words in the output sentence, how robust would the metrics be? Um, they would be quite robust, especially things like BART score, for example. Um, 
BART score is based on the generation probability of the output sentence. And if you shuffled the words, the generation probability would be low. So it would be able to measure that. Um, maybe I'll take two more questions because I saw two hands and then we'll finish up. Yeah. So, so, so I just wanted to verify this is correct. So basically, uh, you're saying uh, the only metrics which stays correlated uh, uh, for the top four and stuff like that are the ones which did not uh, include human evaluation. Uh, did, not, did not, so in the 2019 WMT evaluation, the only ones that stayed correlated were the ones that did not consider the human reference translation. So they were only considered the output. And we are yeah. actually using human reference uh, translation to judge these metrics, which calculate the actually whether a model is better or not. Right. And the metrics are actually also using this human reference which actually became uncorrelated. And they became decorrelated, yeah. So um, that was then, the new metrics might not be that bad, but yes, they de did become decorrelated. I'm just wondering whether there are any such literature before the government. They are actually generating uh, more sophisticated models than the ones that are used in the pandemic. That's the reason why uh, certain metrics like embedding did not embedding so well, uh, whereas there are others which are for older ones, which are the world order like you, uh, they don't look at Okay. This is a very good question. So the question is, are the new systems generating sophisticated, sophisticated translations that humans are not generating? And because of this, they do, uh, they do um, like less well, or evaluation is working less well. It's actually uh, the opposite, perhaps. Um, which is blue used to be good because if you got anywhere close to a human translation, it was probably fine um, because the systems were so bad. Now the systems are really good, but the outputs they tend to generate tend to be more literal than the human translation. So humans might use more flowery language or uh, more idioms or things like this, whereas translation systems uh, will generate literal things. And you can see this yourself uh, by putting something into Google Translate, putting put like 10 idioms into Google Translate, and at least one of them will be translated liter literally, not idiomatically. Um, and so because of this, if humans are using more flowery, less consistent language, it's quite possible that you have three really good systems. One system is a little bit less consistent, less literal. Um, one is a little bit more literal, and the more literal system is actually better but the less consistent or more flowery system matches the human outputs better. So that would be one hypothesis, I guess. Okay, um, great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all the questions and uh, we're over time, so I'll stop there.